but I want to start today, and forgive me if it's just me flapping my gums this morning. We have made efforts um, to have those responsible for our next story appear on the program today. They seem reluctant to do so. But uh, prior to returning to air on Monday morning, I received an email by email uh, from a concerned punter, put it that way, a concerned punter who I thank very much, a link to a document published by the government's media and cultural funding agency, New Zealand On Air. It is called Titariti, that's uh, for people who speak English, the Treaty Framework for News Media. It is a document that complain, contains about eight, eight pages of, if you like, primary material and then a whole lot of background material. It was paid for by you, by New Zealand On Air. It was commissioned by New Zealand On Air and it bears their logo. It is an official government document. It's important that I stress that. It's not an independent piece of research. It has been paid for by you, the taxpayer, and funded by a government taxpayer-funded agency. It is therefore an official, an official document that reflects government policy. Hold on to that thought. This isn't some random thing. It is been written by a bunch of academics, many of them from Massey University, experts in media and journalism. And just to clarify, what does New Zealand On Air do? It distributes, in terms of news media, more than $100 million a year in funding, $80 million per year for what it calls scripted and factual programs or content. And that can cover a wide variety of uh, information, podcasts, um, documentaries, television programs. It has also been responsible for the distribution of the Public Interest Journalism Fund. That is another separate $55 million specifically for news media. And the final round of the Public Journal uh, Interest Journalism Fund is currently underway. That is a $3 million disbursement to those who meet um, the requirements and are going to make the sort of public interest journalism that New Zealand On Air deems by the criteria of this particular document to be appropriate. You do not get any of that more than $80 million funding as a producer of podcast, television, radio, as a news organisation, unless you sign a contract accepting and agreeing to abide by certain criteria in regards to the Treaty of Waitangi. You simply are not eligible if you don't sign a contract agreeing to acquiesce to the official view of the Treaty of Waitangi and its place in New Zealand society. Now, the person who sent me this was clearly concerned, and they only sent me the framework, the first eight pages, was extremely concerned at what they read. And I have to say, for the past week, I too, or in the past few days, I too have been increasingly concerned as I have read this document. At this stage, I must say, there is a reason the platform, as a matter of policy, does not accept government funding um, for its operations. God, we need some, but we're not going to accept it from the government. And the reason is that we are of the philosophical belief that with government funding comes strings attached which literally strangle our ability to do our job properly and be truly independent and impartial news media. It was very much part of the decision I made to set up the platform because I saw the influence of government funding and the group think and speak that was emerging and I was concerned about it. Uh, as I said, you don't get any of this more than $100 million in government funding and it's gone to groups like Stuff, the spin-off, Television New Zealand, Radio New Zealand, 
a swathe of private producers. Much of what Paddy Gower does in his documentaries are funded, guess what, by New Zealand, by New Zealand on air. Um, the documentaries or, or the films about Chloe Schwabrick, um, and they seem to come out with monotonous regularity, they are funded by New Zealand on air. So I think it is important that we as taxpayers and consumers of the news media know what the world view is, what the philosophy is that creates the criteria for getting this more than $100 million in government funding per year. Um, I'm going to tell you that um, we have asked the Chief Executive of New Zealand On Air to appear on the program today. And I will read you... I'll read you first what Ben wrote. Um, he wrote this to um, someone called Catherine, who is uh, Catherine Strati at um, New Zealand On Air. I produced the morning radio show on the platform for Sean Plunkett. Sean would like to interview Cameron uh, Harland. Cameron Harland, who is the chief executive about the New Zealand On Air Commission paper to Tariti Framework for News and Media on his show tomorrow or via phone call, mainly focusing on why the paper was written, who it was distributed to, to what perp is its purpose. If he can be available at this time, please let me know with the contact information provided below. Nice letter, Ben. Good work. Straight up and down, mate. And we got this back from Alana Califatalis, former journalist, and one presumed spin doctor supremo for New Zealand on air. Kia ora, Ben. That's a nice ethnic opening. I'm sure we've communicated before, but if we haven't, just ensuring you have my contact details as I deal with media inquiries for New Zealand on air. Thanks, Alana. I've discussed this request with Cam, and we don't see any point in discussing the, this independently produced paper from March 2022. I refer you to the introduction on our website, which is a very nice way of saying piss off. Um, I don't care if you don't want to talk about it. You're a public servant, Alana, and so is Cameron, and it is not. And do not lie to us. It is not an independently produced paper. You commissioned it, you paid for it, and you published it as New Zealand On Air. It is an official government document not some mushroom that sprouted up under a tree somewhere. So that is why we are not going to get any uh, response as yet from New Zealand on air. And I'm taking you through this, I hope, slowly. I hope you can follow. I hope you've got time to follow. So what is to treaty? The treaty framework for news media, news media, and this $100 million worth of funding that New Zealand on air has published. Well, let's just go to the introduction. This document presents a Tatariti framework for news media as a starting point for news producers to develop their own Tatariti strategies in a way that suit their context. While this framework is grounded in Tatariti of Waitangi and mass media obligations to Māori, I wasn't aware that I had obligations to Māori during my time in the mass media. I always thought I had obligations to the truth. That's the primary obligation that the news media has. Um, as I said, um, obligations to Māori is tangata whenua, people of the land. It may be relevant for other groups who face racism in our society. So suddenly, obligations turn into an obligation regarding racism. So the very introduction to this, to this missive is that New Zealand is racist. Nice start. Nice start. The framework is an overview with action areas and some critical questions that should be useful for the development of media strategies and practices, which to my mind, it goes on a little bit more, but to my mind, fundamentally, it says, this is a document that is going to tell journalists how to suck eggs. And if you don't suck eggs our way, you don't get any money from the taxpayer and we know you're strapped for cash. Also, by the way, as you listen to this, Think about the things that outrage you on television, on TV3 and TVNZ and stuff and spin-off. Think about the things that drive you nuts. And you're going to find, as I talked to you this morning, the genesis for the things that are driving you crazy about the news media 
in New Zealand. It's not an independent document. It is the thought police protocols for the brave new world of news media in New Zealand. Um, let's look at this as a news media framework through. We go on to page five. Rationale. Oh, I'm looking forward to this. Now, as Tangata Whenua, says the document uh, of Aotearoa, or New Zealand as we're more commonly known, Māori, get this, and this is, don't forget, this is the starting point, this is the first gutsy piece of this document. Māori have never ceded sovereignty to Britain or any other state. Um, the Declaration of Independence and the Treaty of Waitangi asserted and continue to assert Māori sovereignty and was signed by Hapu and the Crown. The treaty carries rights and obligations for both parties with implications for social justice. Despite the treaty, colonial constitutional practices have entrenched Pākehā systems of governments that, governance that continue today. This means our society has a foundation of institutional racism, where organisations, agencies and institutions continue to benefit Pākehā and routinely produce policies and practices that result in avoidable inequalities between Pākehā and Māori. So the very basis of this document, folks, the very basis is that New Zealand is a racist country and that Māori are not like the rest of us. They are an independent nation. So to get any money from New Zealand on air and the taxpayer as a journalist and a media organisation, you have to accept that we live in a country which we are the occupiers in. If you're non-Māori, all non-Māori, that's what I presume they mean by Pākehā, are colonial oppressors. We are racist, our institutions are racist, and Māori have a right to their own form of governance and government that is separate from being part of the Westminster-style democracy we call New Zealand, run by a parliament through elections every three years. That is the starting point of the philosophy that news organisations must accept and implement to get more than $100 million or be able to get any slice of the more than $100 million in government funding available to news organisations. I want to ask you the question, and I'd love you to text in, is that a view of New Zealand that you agree with? That we are separate peoples living in a racist post-colonial society that Māori, however you choose to define them, have not ceded sovereignty, do not need to recognise the parliament that we have, or the way our system of law and governance works, because that is fundamentally the basic rationale of this entire document. And I wonder how many New Zealanders would agree with that. And I, I stress again, this is not an independent think piece by some wokesters at Massey University. This has been paid for by you, it has been commissioned by a government agency, and it has been published by a government agency in the context of criteria for allocating government money. Um, it also says, news media organisations have an obligation to be accountable and responsible in the way they represent Māori and decide what is newsworthy, as well as how they organise their own structures and processes to align with the Treaty of Waitangi. Or one might say, this document's incredibly radical and separatist interpretation of the Treaty of Waitangi. I can't remember Article 77.A, which says, read news media and radio being written in the treaty. So one can presume this has all been made up post the actual signing of the treaty. But this believes, and the government therefore believes, that there is an obligation on the news media to give Māori some special status, some special status in regards to this. The document then goes through a whole lot of action plans and questions that media organisations who want to get their hands on taxpayer funds, um, they've got to ask questions about how they recognise the treaty. 
Who's leading the work in their organisation to recognise the treaty? How does it, the, the organisation take responsibility for its culture and environment? How do news practices need to change to reflect the treaty? How does the organisation embed autonomy for Māori news into its work? What's the difference, for goodness sake, between Māori news and normal news? The truth, some facts, presented in context. That's the way journalism works. Um, how do you assess what stories are newsworthy in light of the treaty? Well, stories your audience are going to be interested in, no matter the colour of their skin or their ethnic background. Um, what are the values, we should ask ourselves, that result in inequitable reporting of Māori and Māori issues? Well, that's presuming you think the reporting is inequitable. Um, also in action areas, staff recruitment and training support. I do not, by the way, the platform would appear not to meet any of these criteria, and I'm damn proud of it. How does journalism training need to change to teach and reflect on the treaty-based pra journalism practices? Who says it does? How do media organisations recruit, train and support and actively promote Māori journalists? I'll promote journalists, good journalists, no matter what the colour of their skin is. Um, how do they get them into management and decision-making positions? Well, they're good at their jobs. It's called a meritocracy, New Zealand on air. They are good at what they do. They are fair, balanced, impartial. They're not a-holes. But, oh, no, they've got to be the right ethnicity as well. How are non-Māori staff trained so they can cover Māori stories? Um... This includes the Treaty of Waitangi History and Interpretation, Te Reo Pronunciation, Tikanga, and Understanding Colonial History. What about Understanding All History? Um, now, okay, <laughs> you get the idea, and I'll explain why this has dominated my life for the last few nights. There's a section in this called Societal Accountabilities. Um, you're not going to believe what you hear next. Um, and once again, don't forget, official government document paid for by you, published by New Zealand On Air, criteria for getting money from the taxpayer. As a result of colonisation, we live in a society that perpetuates racism and inequities. In response, many Maori organisations and networks are decolonising and Pākehā-led non-government organisations are restructuring themselves according to Te Treaty of Waitangi. For news media, it is not simply a matter of reporting fairly, but of constructively contributing to the treaty relations and social justice. Boy, are they telling us how to suck eggs at an enormous rate of knots. So the government is arguing through this document that we're in a process of decolonisation and the news media must be actively involved in that process. Shouldn't it? Should be actively result, revol, uh, actively involved in telling the truth and reflecting changes in our society. It goes on. Media organisations need to consider the colonial context of living in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and identify structural causes, institutional racism, colonisation, inequities, and Pakiha advantage that influence their reporting and the issues they report. So you have to recognise white privilege. White privilege must be part of the culture of your news organisation to get any money from the Public Interest Journalism Fund or from New Zealand On Air. So one presumes when Paddy Gower makes his partially state-funded documentaries, he recognises post-colonial white privilege. Um, there is a reference to male privilege and 50-year-old males later on in the document. So it is full of its own prejudice and bile. Um, this domain focuses on how news media construct and present issues, particularly where the broader accountabilities and systems are considered and how Māori are represented. Two pages of detailed examples of alternative practices are provided in the evidence section. So how to be woke. It is literally an instruction book on how to be woke. And remember, if you're not woke, 
if you don't pay lip service to wokedom and uh, and adopt these recommendations, you are, are ineligible for more than $100 million, or your, your share, your slice of more than $100 million in government, free government money. Um, look, they go on to talk about worldviews and norms. Um, you have to ask yourself, how does the organisation address the issue of use of language and culture in news items? This could mean increasing everyday use of te reo Māori in news items and including information about tikanga as context in news stories. So, so many people I read say, I don't understand the weather anymore. Are we speaking English or are we speaking Māori? Well, we're speaking both. And this is the official guide, suggestion guide. This is where it comes from. It's telling news media to get the money, you've got to throw in some Māori words and be woke. There we go, it's right there. Well, actually, in red and white, it's published, not black and white. How does the organisation question and broaden its interpretation of news values by considering Māori-controlled news media interpretations without putting an excess burden on Māori staff? Now, that's the other thing. You want to have a Māori perspective. Don't work the Māori staff too hard in giving a Māori perspective. All the while, throughout this document, it delineates between someone who is a Māori reporter and a Pākehā. And they use Pākehā, it seems to me, in this document in the context of white, uh, if not subliminally white male. Um, it is a document that speaks very little about Pacific Islanders, other immigrants from other places, other cultures, other ethnicities, doesn't talk about Indian people particularly, um, Asian people particularly. It has a very binary, bicultural view of uh, the world. Um, and it's also got some instructions, though, I've got to be fair, it also tells Māori media organisations how, how to suck eggs. I could go on and on and on. I've spent hours poring over this. And it is so, so disappointing. It is so disappointing that New Zealand On Air won't front to talk to this official document that has lied saying it's an independent report. No, no, it's an independent report you commissioned, paid for and published. It's policy. It's New Zealand on air policy. And here are the hoops laid out before us, the hoops that our news media are jumping through to scrabble for the crumbs of government funding that are handed out to them. And how willing they are to accept Willie Jackson's view of a completely separate New Zealand world, where there are going to be two governments and two nations in the one landmass. And this is the philosophy. This is the brave new world of New Zealand on air and your mainstream media. And I believe this needs to be discussed this year. I believe this is what David Seymour when he is on about when he talks about the creation of an ethno-state. And we are using taxpayers' dollars and this sort of propaganda, this sort of racism, to achieve that goal. I, for one, as a journalist, am firstly completely affront. By the way, lots of mention is made of stuff and how wonderful stuff is in this document, how it apologised for all its post-colonial reporting. So you look at stuff and its attitude to news and this, its view of this country, its woke view of this country, this is where it comes from. <clears throat> Documents like this. And if that's what you want, if you're happy with the service you're getting from the state-funded media, I guess you say, I'm cool with that. I agree with everything that's in here. Uh, and I'm not just asking you to listen to the platform because we don't do it that way, and I'm telling you, as long as there's, you know, blood in my veins and it's pumping, we won't be doing it that way. Um, but you need to make your outrage, which may not be as deep in mine, because this is my job, this is my career, my profession. I'd also say it's my country. Along with everyone else, it's my country. And a document like this makes me worry very much about the profession I'm in and also the country I live in. We are going to publish a link to this today, to the entire document. 
Um, I could write an outrage column. I've done my bit for the last half hour on here to tell you about it. Um, but we're going to publish a link to the document and could I please beg you to read it and share it. And uh, if you've got issues with New Zealand on here, approach the Broadcasting Minister and the Minister of Culture, Minister of Culture and Heritage, and let's make some noise. Let's tell them that the treaty framework for news media is ethno-state claptrap. And these criteria of political correctness, government funding and media must be lifted. And in fact, maybe we should just get rid of government funding of news media and let the market decide. I thank you for your patience. I thank you for listening for me. to me. I know that was a bit ravey, uh, but I had to get it off my chest.